Good morning, and welcome to Audubon Park Church. My name is Jeff. I'm one of the pastors here, and I am so glad to welcome you to worship this morning. If you're watching with us on our website, we'd love for you to uh, fill out an online connection card. You'll find that link there right on the website uh, so that we know you're watching with us. We'd love for you to sign in. If you're watching from YouTube or Facebook, we'd love for you to leave a comment so that uh, we know you're worshiping with us today. Audubon Park Church longs to be a church of prayer, and you can help us uh, by sharing your prayer requests with us. So if you're um, praying for someone, if there's something going on in your life that you could use some prayers for, uh, please uh, reach out to us. Uh, share a prayer requests through that uh, connection card on the website, or just drop a comment on Facebook or YouTube so that we know how we can be praying for you. After today's service, we have a virtual coffee hour. It's just a time to connect with one another, uh, check in, see each other's faces. And we hope you'll consider joining that. The link for that coffee hour time will be available in during the last song of the service in the comment section. Uh, you can also find it in the email I sent out on Friday and on the website. So uh, just give it a chance, uh, make a, take, make a a quick second to click on that link and join us for coffee hour at the end of the service. Well, we're in week two of our series of sermons on the Sermon on the Mount. Last week, we talked about the Beatitudes. This week, uh, we ta start talking about Jesus's relationship uh, with the law. You know, the Pharisees uh, saw Jesus as breaking the law all the time. But in our text for today, Jesus says that he came not to uh, abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And so we'll be exploring righteousness and the law and the grace of God uh, in our sermon for today. Thank you for worshiping with us. Uh, let us center ourselves, prepare our hearts and minds as we begin worship through our call to worship. Please join me in the call to worship. God commanded, let there be light, and there was light. Jesus revealed, I am the light of the world, and the light shone in the darkness. Jesus promised, you are the light of the world. Let our light shine before others to glorify God. Eternal God, you bring light out of darkness and hope out of despair. Share your love with us this hour that we may better love and care for your children here and everywhere. Touch our hearts so that our lives act as beacons shining your light in a world that desperately needs illumination. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I lay my burdens at your feet. I'm letting go of all the things I can't control In my frailty, Lord, I find your strength I'm depending on a love that I won't let go So I trust you, I trust you, I trust you, oh I trust you, I trust you, I trust you, oh, you are my peace. I lay my burdens at your
Yes, I trust you. I trust you. I trust you. Holy one, I Blessings to you all. Uh, Carol and I bring our greetings again this week from our household to yours. And we trust and pray that you are continuing to be well, continuing to find your way forward in grace as we uh, find new ways of being during this particular time of our lives. As, uh, as we begin our prayer time, I, I, I want to back up uh, just a, a few weeks to uh, Pastor Jeff's series on faith and, and politics uh, uh, as he lifted up uh, uh, scriptural images that, that, that helped us through that time. Um, I have in my life what I'm sure many of you do in yours. One of the, one of the people that I am closest to in this world, uh, and I can can barely civilly discuss politics with one another because we were we are <clears throat> we love each other <clears throat> but we're at polar opposites and have difficulty uh, understanding one another hmm. pardon me <clears throat> <clears throat> so i <clears throat> i was spending some time in prayer this week and uh uh, again, found myself drawn to the first few lines of uh, the prayer of St. Francis. Uh, I found it, by the way, in, uh, in a little upper room prayer guide that I, that I have. Uh, 
that uh, is uh, named uh, uh, a guide to prayer for ministers and other servants. I've had it for years, and it absolutely is one of my favorite places to go when I'm seeking. Now, here's what I <clears throat> want to invite you to do. I'm going to do a very deliberate reading of the first few lines of Francis's prayer, and uh, uh, I'll pause and just give a, a moment for you to, to soak, and maybe even allow uh, faces and names to come to your mind of, of those that, that uh, maybe you have difficulty being in discussion with. Here we go. Just this deep reminder of wonderful truth. Lord, make me an, an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Sow, S-O-W. Let me sow love. Where there is injury, and it doesn't take long in some of those discussions for there to be injury. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, and we know that darkness is always trying to uh, uh, envelop and separate us, uh, each from the other. Where, where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. I encourage you to return to these words by this uh, deep and learned and spiritually centered saint. And though we may not all be saints, I pray that we can live those words out with one another. I want us to now, as we move into our pastoral prayer time, I will conclude the, the, the reading of St. Francis's prayer as, as a, a, an affirmation of faith. So uh, just join me in spirit as we affirm the source of our faith. O oh, Divine Master, Grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as <clears throat> to love. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. And now I want to lift a, a series of uh, bidding prayers for our pastoral prayer time. Uh, we will respond with, uh, response I've used a few times now, with uh, we lift them up, O Lord, uh, after, after each uh, uh, bidding prayer. Uh, and then there will be places for you to pause, and, and I encourage you to verbally, whether you're worshiping alone or, or with others, to verbally lift names and needs as they come to heart and mind. <clears throat> Let us pray together. Precious Lord, we again pray for those in, in our families, community, and nation 
who are struggling with the effects of the coronavirus, including now our, our president, his family, <clears throat> the many government uh, officials that are currently infected. For all of these, together, we lift them up, O oh Lord. We pray for those uh, seeking employment, for those uh, who may be uh, on the brink of or have already lost jobs, homes, and even their daily bread. Together, we lift them up, O Lord. We pray for those of our own congregation uh, who face uh, health challenges of various sorts. Uh, we pray also for those who are going through particular times of, of blessing. We lift to you Jerry Hood, uh, who spent some time hospitalized this past week. And uh, we pray for those who are attending to his care, that there be discernment and, and uh, wisdom in terms of his uh, forthgoing treatment. We pray for Kimberly Cree and Eric McMurtry as they uh, exchanged their wedding vows in, in this place uh, recently. And we ask that in a very special and particular way, you would be with them as they begin their married journey. And now let us take a moment and just lift others who are upon our hearts. I would begin by lifting Cole Peterson and, and his family. Add your liftings, if you would. Together, we lift them up, O oh Lord. We pray for leaders in our government, our businesses, our churches, our, our schools. We pray for all of those having to make difficult choices and decisions. We ask for your wisdom and guidance. Fill them, each one, with uh, your spirit of compassion and, and give them necessary courage to make hard choices. Bless them in the deep places just now. Together, we lift them up, O Lord. Hear us now as we offer up the prayer our, our Lord taught to his disciples in every age, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from all evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The scripture this morning comes to us from the book of Matthew, chapter 5, 13 through 20. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? 
It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one after lighting a lamp puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or put the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same, will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Scott Jose, a preacher and professor of preaching at Calvin College, uses the perfect illustration to help us connect with our text for today. Picture in your mind a freckle-faced, red-headed young boy named Joey. Joey is all of about eight years old and has been taking piano lessons for about a year. Joey has gotten reasonably proficient at plinking out twinkle, twinkle, little star, and is slowly moving on to slightly more challenging pieces. His hope is that one day he will be a reasonably decent piano player, someone who can accompany a Christmas carol sing-along over the holidays or maybe learn how to play some favorite movie songs from, from things like Harry Potter or something. Well, actually, Joey is eight years old, and so we all know these hopes probably belong to his parents, not him. Regardless, imagine Joey's reaction if one day his piano teacher sat him down on the piano bench, looked Joey straight in the eye, and said, Joey, unless your ability to play the piano, to play the most challenging etudes of Chopin, exceeds that of Vladimir Horowitz, the greatest piano player of all time, then there really is no sense in you playing the piano at all. Well, now, surely this would widen Joey's eyes. And once the depth of this demand began to sink in, Joey would almost certainly despair and consider giving up on the piano altogether. Do not think I came to get rid of God's law, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. No, I came to fulfill it such that if your own righteousness does not exceed that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, then you most assuredly are not going to be a part of my kingdom. Just imagine hearing that. This too must have widened the eyes of Jesus' disciples when he spoke this fairly early on in the Sermon on the Mount. After all, no one was better at keeping the law than the Pharisees. They were to the law what Gordon Ramsay is to to gourmet cooking, or what Stephen Hawking was to physics, or what Johnny Carson was to late night television. They were the best. You can't top them. How could the disciples and and how could we today receive those words of Jesus as anything less than utterly demoralizing? But then again, how could Jesus himself have said this given that his own interactions with the Pharisees were, were all too negative in the Gospels? Truth is, Jesus didn't seem to think much of the lifestyle or the attitudes of the religious leaders of his day. He regarded them as shams, as as nitpickers who loved rules at the expense of loving people. In fact, before the Gospel of Matthew is finished, Jesus will go so far as to call them whitewashed tombs, people who shine up their outward appearance in the hopes you won't notice the death, the decay, and the ugliness inside of them. Apparently, then, what what we have in Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, is another example of Jesus' 
favorite rhetorical device, hyperbole. Jesus loved a good hyperbole. Tree trunks sticking out of people's eyes, whole camels slipping down people's throats, or, or camels threading the eye of a tiny sewing needle. This was Jesus' style. But if such hyperboles could not be taken literally, that doesn't mean the point behind them is any less vital or, or any less relevant. In the case of Matthew chapter 5, Jesus seems to be pointing to the impossible only to hint that with God all things are possible. No, you can't do this on your own. But God can do it in Jesus, and Jesus in turn can transfer all of his righteousness to you as a gift of pure grace. As I said last week, the, the Sermon on the Mount is not a long list of entrance requirements for the kingdom of God. This is not a checklist that once you can put a big red check mark in every moral box, you get rewarded for having earned your way into God's kingdom. Jesus prefaces this unbelievably demanding statement in our text for today with the Beatitudes we explored last week. And I think Jesus does that to assure us that God's blessing is not based on our effort our, or our accomplishments. Blessed are the poor. Blessed are those who mourn. We don't have to earn God's blessing or God's love. We couldn't earn it if we tried. God just loves us. God just loves the underdog, the hurting, the oppressed, the poor. We have God's grace and love from the very beginning. Everything in this sermon, from the Beatitudes at the very start of the sermon to the closing parable about the wise and foolish builders, is all about God's grace grabbing hold of you and filling you up to the brim with the goodness of God. How else could you explain the opening of this passage? Jesus tells the disciples they are salt and light. Now notice he doesn't say they might become salty and light if, if they try really hard. This isn't a prediction or a promise that may or may not come true at some future moment. Jesus flat out declares that the disciples, those still clueless, still confused, still wet behind the ears, fishermen who had only lately been invited to follow Jesus. Jesus says that these very followers are salt and light. That was their status, period. They had no more earned that status than, than they at that very moment really understood what it meant. But there it was, salt and light. That too was a gift of grace, of course, as was the superior righteousness that Jesus mentions in verse 20. But the way to receive this gift requires a childlike openness to receive and go with the new thing that God is doing in this newly minted rabbi, this former carpenter from Nazareth. The entire Gospel of Matthew is about God's upending conventional expectations and ordinary ways of doing things so as to reveal a whole new way to perceive the world and God's purpose in that world. God's got more going on in more places and in more people than you could guess. Matthew starts his gospel by teaching us that in the family tree of Jesus, uh, teaching us this in the family tree of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1. Mostly in that genealogy of Jesus, you get that you get the usual suspects, of course, in lineages. But just to make things interesting, Matthew throws in Tamar and Rahab and Ruth and Bathsheba as a reminder that God was able to work through a lot of sexual uh, tawdriness and through a lot of non-Israelites to produce the Messiah. And if that disturbs your moral sensibilities, well, then welcome to the club of the righteous who have to relearn the depths of true righteousness in order to recognize and welcome the true Messiah. And on that score, Jesus' father, Joseph, was exhibit A. Joseph, we are told, in Matthew chapter 1, was a righteous man, and so he was. And so he knew the righteous, law-abiding thing to do when your 
fiance turns up pregnant, and when you know that it's not you who got her that way. But just as Joseph is drawing up the perfectly righteous divorce papers, an angel comes to point him to a broader righteousness that would come through Mary's child, through the one who would be Emmanuel, the God with us. Joseph was the first of many righteous people who, if they were going to stay truly righteous and on the side of the one true God of Israel, would have to come to a whole new understanding. We are never told this in the Bible, but we are probably safe to assume that Joseph took some heat from the righteous Pharisees for staying with Mary. Nobody would believe the truth, and so maybe Joseph and Mary didn't bother to tell anyone either. Small wonder that Mary gets mentioned in the same family tree as Tamar and Rahab and the whiffs of prostitution that emanated from them like cheap perfume. Mary, too, was regarded as one of those kinds of women. But God was up to something bigger and deeper than the bruising of one's reputation, and so Joseph and Mary did as the angels directed. The child that Mary birthed eventually uh, came in to his fair share of public condemnation as well from the Pharisees and religious authorities. Jesus was a far cry from righteous in their book. He broke God's law, mixed in with the wrong people, failed to keep the Sabbath, contaminated himself with every filthy, undesirable person he ran across. Yet in our passage for today from Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says he was actually keeping the law right down to its slightest pen stroke, even as he was achieving a righteousness so peerless and pure that why you'd have to be God himself to do any better. It all seemed backwards and upside down and was surely unexpected, and to many, at least, was also downright inexplicable. At the end of the day, the only way to deal with this Jesus, this sham of righteousness, was to cross him out and be rid of him once and for all. That way, everybody could go back to their previously scheduled programming where righteousness involved ever and only rule-keeping and not much being loving toward all people, just toward some, just toward those already like you. Of course, the deepest irony of the gospel is that never did the righteousness of Jesus exceed that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law more than, than than that moment when he stretched his arms out on the cross and cried out, it is finished and so drew all people to himself in gracious and perfect love. That's not the end of the story, though. We do have to respond to lean into those righteous patterns. We get to be salt and light by grace alone, but still Jesus had to worry about salt losing its savor and light being hidden instead of shining for all to see. And mostly, the way that happens today is exactly when we, too, let rules and and scruples come to mean more to us than people do. Or we let our long-held customary way of doing things stand in the way of seeing other people as welcome in the sight of God. The preacher, Nadia Bowles Weber, tells a story. uh, She told it a while back that really made me laugh. I laughed because it was at once the reverse of something, a phenomenon we all know all too well, while at the same time being the same old thing all over again. Nadia Bowles Weber, if you know anything about her, she's not your typical Lutheran pastor. Uh, Most people who see her tattooed covered body and her inclination to wear wear clothing associated more with motorcycle gangs than, than Sunday service, well, most people don't think Nadia is any type of pastor. But she is. And before leaving the church, she founded to... Uh, to to write and speak naturally, she had one of the fastest growing churches in the country filled with people who tend to look a lot, whole lot like her, people who would normally never grace the door of any of our churches. 
Now, the problem is Nadia can really preach. And so she attracted a whole lot of attention. And before you knew it, people in suit jackets and dresses and more typical going to church attire started showing up for Sunday mornings at her new church. And believe it or not, the tattooed crowd didn't like having those kind of people around. We get so used to, to, to defining righteousness and the Christian way of doing things to whatever it is we have grown accustomed to so that we are no longer open to the surprises that God has in store for us. The heart of God's law has all along been love. Not love in the abstract or love as something you reserve for those who are already a whole lot like you. No, this divine love is a radical love. The kind of love God took a gamble on when he decided to create a whole universe of other creatures with whom to share the effervescent love of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the love that the triune God had enjoyed from all eternity. You know, a while back, someone asked the preacher and writer Eugene Peterson what he would say if he were writing what he knew would be his very last sermon. Peterson replied, I think I would want to talk about things that are immediate and ordinary. In the kind of world we live in, the primary way that I can get people to be aware of God is to say, who are you going to have breakfast with tomorrow and how are you going to treat that person? In my last sermon, I guess I'd want to say, go home and be good to your spouse. Treat your children with respect. Do a good job at work. Peterson is right. We need to be righteous people of salt and light in the world. And that involves genuinely being with real people, listening to them well and treating them as the little images of God that they are. Along the way, we will be deeply surprised now and then at who God brings into our lives we will discover that sometimes the most moral thing to do is the one thing that will cause others to regard us as immoral, as loosey-goosey, as not keeping up our standards. It happens, but that's okay. It happened over and over again to Jesus too. And he fulfilled all righteousness there ever was. Thanks be to God. Amen. Jesus calls us o'er the tumult of our lives While restless sea, day by day his sweet voice sounded Saying, Christian, follow me As of old the apostles heard it by the Galilean lake Turn from home and toil and kindred, leaving all for Jesus' sake. In our joys and in our sorrows, days of toil and hours of ease, still he calls in cares and pleasures, Christian love me more than thee. Jesus calls us by the mercies, Savior, may we hear thy call. Give our hearts to thine obedience, serve and love thee best of all. Thank you so much for joining us for worship today. I hope you'll Stick around, click on that link, and join us for virtual coffee hour as well. Let us go out into the world to be the, the salt of the earth, the light of the world, that we might show God's love to every person and creature we encounter. May the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with us all 
now and forever. Amen. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all. Christ I stand There in the ground His body lay Light of the world by darkness slain Then burst and forth In glorious day Up from the grave He rose again And as He stands in victory since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am He, and He is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me, from life's first cry. To final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever cut me from His hand. Till He returns or calls me home, in the power of Christ I stand. Till He returns. So it calls me home, here in the power of Christ I'll see.